Talk of the town, not too far away this morning. But first, whether we're comfortable with it or not, I think the our future is increasingly entwined with technology. So time this morning for another look at some of the big issues in that space. We're joined by Matthew Dickerson, a uh, technology business owner in Dubbo. And a very good morning to you once again, Matthew. Yeah, good morning, Ewan. Just for the record there, the rain stopped here in Dubbo after listening to your rain report there. It's, it's been and gone. It's, uh, it looked like it was very promising this morning and then it t- kind of disappeared. Right. Well, don't, well, hang in there because uh, according to the Weather Bureau, it should, you know, they'll be roaming around for the rest of today. So uh, you may get a second chance at this, Matthew. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed indeed. Now, smart cars may be making us dumber drivers. That's the information coming from some driving instructors who are dealing with this obviously every day. And I think it becomes one of those things where maybe complacency, maybe overconfidence, but obviously all the talk from the vehicle manufacturers, Tesla's obviously leading the way, but lots of other manufacturers as well, is about all the autonomous features coming out on modern cars. We're not quite there yet. There have been millions of kilometres driven by cars in autonomous mode under strict conditions, but we're not quite there yet where we jump in and tell our car to take us down and, and take us to the supermarket and do our shopping for us. But... Lots of those features that are slowly creeping in are giving people all this confidence. So sticking in your lane, for example, getting too close to the car in front of you or the car in front of you is pulling up so it alerts you that you should put your brakes on. Even ABS, and and I'm a little bit older than you, Ewan, but back when I learned to drive, one of the crucial things was to learn that if you put your brakes on too hard in an emergency, you'd lock your wheels up so you had to release the brakes and put them back on again. A modern driver, of course, you just jam that brake on as hard as you can because ABS will take care of it and you steer around something with your brakes fully on. So all these little things that are slowly creeping in are are definitely making the cars safer, but as a consequence, people are still relying on it maybe too much. And one of the points that some of the driving instructors pointed to was that we spend about $27 billion a year in this country on car crashes, an incredible number, but 30% of those car crashes are people running into the back of another car. And that was one example where they said, that's just from not paying attention. That's just from either tailgating or, or maybe looking down at your phone, but just not paying enough attention. There shouldn't be that many people running into the back of each other. But because we're waiting for maybe the beeps from the car or some alert from the car to tell us we're getting too close, and by the time that happens, maybe we're already too close, and so suddenly we've, you've got a break, and you, you might have a slower crash than you would have had in the past, but you're still having that crash. So it is something that, I mean, what the driving instructors are probably pushing for is for people to go back and do more driver training. It might be uh, something uh, hidden away in their agenda there. But I think there is a good point to be made. And, and one thing that I remember was when airbags were introduced in America, a lot of people didn't wear their seatbelts. And, and when they get pulled up for not wearing their seatbelt, they'd say, I've got airbags. I don't need seatbelts anymore. So really? sometimes, yeah, sometimes people get a little bit confused by the technology or overconfident with the technology. I remember when they first unveiled uh, reverse parallel parking, the cars that would do that for themselves. And uh, I, I think anybody who's ever uh, struggled with having to do a reverse parallel park cheered a little bit. But it's, with that technology, it, it, don't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be rolled out very widely these days. I wonder whether you know, it's just kind of died off a little bit. Well, I think it's it's getting there, but I agree. Like I've had four of my kids going through do their L's, and that was always the the dread in the test yeah. when they had to go and do it. Oh no, my parallel park! It's going to be terrible. And I think one of my kids has said after they did the driving test, they've never parallel parked again, so they just avoid those parks. So that, that sort of technology, though, you've got that coming out in cars, and you see them in bits and pieces with that. Obviously, that'll increase as time goes on, but you hope that people don't lose those skills altogether. No. Yeah, anybody who's, uh, every time I jump into a hire car, for example, because it's usually a new car and you have to, you spend half the time trying to work out which beep is which beep, you know, whether you've drifted across your lane or whether it's, you're too close to someone in front or the sun's impacting the your vision, whatever it is, the car just constantly beeps at you. But if you become obsessed with it and you get used to it, then of course... Uh, you, you'll um, you'll wait for the beep, and sometimes the beep won't come. And you'll yeah. hit someone hit someone in front. Or well, well, the other thing I think you and is you become a little bit immune to the beep, so you just hear various beeps and then get to the point where they mean nothing, and then suddenly, oops, that one did actually mean something. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, turn them off at least once a week, all of the beats, and see how you go. Uh, <laughs> Matthew Diggerson's with us this morning. We're talking uh, technology. Now, Matthew, do you pay for your entertainment subscriptions? And by that, I mean sort of things like um, Disney Plus or Stan or Netflix. Do you pay for those out of your own pockets? Well, I'm, I'm one of only half of the Australians that do pay for them, Ewan. Good on you. <laughs> it's it's, a, they're, they're one, one half of Australians apparently don't. No, that's right. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're incredibly popular. We're seeing all those streaming services, the Netflix, the Stands, the Disney Pluses, there seems to be a new one coming out each week, some new niche product or some mass market product coming out. And we love them in this country. Some reports have us up as as high as 88% of the population are using those streaming services. But when you're getting them for free, it's probably not too bad. And so half of those people aren't paying for them. Now, some of the, the streaming providers themselves, they allow multiple screens. But if you read the terms of service, probably most people are breaking the terms of service because they say you can have multiple screens in the one household. It doesn't mean your daughter that's gone, that's gone off to university or your, your brother that's living around the corner can use that service, but that's what happens in most of these cases. There's no real shock in it, Ewan, that Gen Z are the worst offenders. 75% of, of Gen Zers said the service they use isn't in their name. So you can imagine most of those Gen Zers are probably using mum and dad's account and, and Gen Z up to about the age of 24. So those people are either, say, at school or away at school or away at university or even, you know, they've maybe got their first job and haven't got a lot of money. So they're, they're bludging off mum and dad typically is, is the, the main message there. But Gen X, a bit surprisingly, were the next biggest freeloaders. 51% of Gen Xs weren't actually paying for their own streaming service. Uh, and then down to Gen Y at 38%. But when you start to, to look at just how popular they are and, and compare it to free-to-air TV, 2016, free-to-air TV was in 90% of people's faces in terms of around the country. That's already dropped back to 82%, and you can really see that most of that slack has been taken up by streaming services. They went from 25% in 2016 up to that 88% now. So there's certainly a, a big move that way. Netflix is number one. 69% of Aussies say that they've got Netflix which is almost double the next one, which is Stan with only 36%, uh, and then they drop off pretty quickly from there on. So it's certainly part of our day-to-day -day lives. I hear people now talking more about Netflix shows they saw on TV last night rather than free-to-air shows, mm. uh, but it's certainly something that um, if everyone had to pay for it, I wonder whether it would be quite as popular. Yeah, well, that's the, the truth of it, isn't it? By the time you, you've signed up for two or three of these, you're looking at $20, $30 a month minimum, and many people have five or six once you include things like music streaming with Spotify or Apple Music and uh, maybe newspaper subscriptions and all those sorts of things as well. It can add up. It does surprise me, Matthew, that we haven't actually seen some sort of technology company come out and kind of promise to help us manage all of these multiple subscriptions in our lives. Well, it's actually interesting. I've actually done some calculations of the numbers, which I'll give you in a moment, but I've been asked that question before about some sort of conglomeration of those services, but they're all in such tight competition. I don't think any of those providers would be happy to allow someone else to, to use that sort of combining effect, because that would be fantastic, because sometimes people only subscribe to a service for one show that they like yeah. to watch, but those streaming services like that because they want you to subscribe to their one service so that, that doesn't work for them but I did some costing if you actually subscribe to every service that is available in this nation at the premium level so getting the 4k or the multiple screens whatever the premium might be you'd be up for about $260 a month. Now, it would be silly to, to scrub to all of them. Some of them are very much niche. It might be just English soccer you want to watch or it might be just British comedy you want to watch. So you wouldn't logically do it, but you're right. There's a lot of people. In fact, 10% of us have four or more subscriptions just to streaming services. That doesn't include the music ones that you mentioned, mm. just streaming services. So 10% have got four or more. And again, I think largely that would be driven by, I'll just use this service because of this one show that I want to watch. Because it's you, you don't have enough hours in a day to, to watch four different streaming services and get a bit of good content out of all of them. Yeah, and if you're not watching your credit card closely enough, you, you might just think it's $10 here, $10 there, but uh, as you say, it adds up by the time you've got uh, quite a few of them over, over the period of a month. Uh, an interesting space to watch, and uh, yeah, all of those of you who aren't paying for them, uh, except for step up and uh, <laughs> be like Matthew this morning and start paying for at least half of your subscription services. Uh, Matthew Dickerson, a joy to talk to you as always. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Matthew Dickerson, a tech business owner.